While we're waiting, let's sing. Okay? How about a golden oldie like, I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joys we share as we tarry there none other has ever known wonder if i can drop that lower i used to be a tenor as you can tell <laughs> let's see he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and how about this blessed assurance jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Praise the Lord. I think it's about time to start, but I'm still stalling. Now, while I'm waiting for people, let me get, get some things out of the way. A number of people have asked of myself and Paula, where can we learn more of what you're teaching? And uh, would let you know that we have a three-week basic school and a two-week advanced school. And the school can be attended in a number of ways. One, you can do it by correspondence. That's not the best way. Or you can do it by facilitated school. To have a facilitated school, you just contact Elijah House, and we will have somebody come who has been through the school. That's the facilitator. And then all the teachings are sent. You, if, uh, if 10 people will sign up and pay for the course, we send free all 39 videotape teachings plus five demonstration tapes of counseling and all the school books and instructions how to hold the course. And then you can hold the course at whatever speed you want to, like one lesson a week, like each weekend do four or five, or do one whole week at a time. Or you can come to the live school, which is held in Spokane in June, and uh, all three weeks. After you complete our school, either by correspondence, videotape, or by live school, you get a certificate which nobody recognizes but us. <laughs> but you have to have that to attend the advanced school. The advanced school is very advanced and uh, we don't even allow it to be taped because we don't want that information going out 
you know, a little information is a dangerous thing in some places. And we teach about such things as borderline personality, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, homosexuality, uh, demonic things, uh, sexual problems, and so on. And uh, so that's how you can learn more. And of course, then you can learn more by ordering tapes and books from Elijah House. Elijah House is on the internet, and it's just non-capitalized ElijahHouse.org. And you get it. Yes. Normally it's held live just once a year in June in Whitworth College in Spokane. But uh, you can attend. And what you can do, you can take uh, one week by correspondence, one week by facilitated, another week by live. You know, it's however you get it done. Yeah, if you take it live, it's three full cal calendar weeks. Well, except the last week ends on Friday, so you're minus two days. But yes, at the at the school, whether it's facilitated or live, what happens is you have teachings, and the, well, let's just say a live school. You have two teachings in the morning, and then after lunch or to break time and then there's another teaching or a demonstration and then you have about two, two and a half hours of small group ministry where you're practicing what you've been learning. And then in the evening you have homework that you have to do. And uh, so it's a very intensive school. Part cost? I don't know. They keep changing it on me and Paula and I are traveling all the time so I'm not up on the latest. <laughs> You have to uh, find out from Elijah House how much it costs. I think that the whole three-week school would be about $655, but I'm not sure, which is really very cheap. I mean, seminars used to cost a lot more than that. Yes, we uh, do relate to Elel Ministries, and um, I understand they are conducting our Elijah House School one week at a time. Paul and I did it last year in June in England for them, the whole three-week school. Okay, I think probably as many people as are coming in are in. So, let's begin with prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are here to teach us. We thank you that you are the Lord. And that in your Lordship you have chosen us. You've called us out of darkness and into light. We could have been wandering around in the world full of recrimination and problem and trouble. But you called us out of that to yourself. And having called us, you have gone to work deep within our hearts to set us free from all the woundings and the structures that were built in us. And uh, you're teaching us how to set others free. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. Let now the Holy Spirit rule in all that we say and do together as we talk about parental inversion. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. In the beginning, I want to say that we like to do this kind of teaching totally informally so that at any point you can raise a hand. I urge you, if you want to, to raise a hand and uh, ask a question. You'll have to project your voice loudly because this ear doesn't work and this one's not too good. <laughs> and so uh, I may have trouble hearing you. And uh, I will answer your question. If you hear something and wish you hadn't, ask a question and I'll hit you with it again. And uh, sometimes the Holy Spirit gets us by the question and answer time into those areas he really wants to talk about. And uh, so then you're free to do that at any time. We may stop at any point and uh, pray. In the end, uh, we will have a question and answer time. That in the two I've done so far, those have been the most lively times. And uh, 
we've really enjoyed them. So at that time, we will have question and answer time, and then we'll have a long time of ministry. The teaching on parental inversion is not as long as some of the teachings, so we'll have enough time for ministry. Okay? Parental inversion occurs whenever one or both parents flake out, lose it, are ill, leave the home. Something disrupts the ability of the parents to do the parenting. And then one of the children takes responsibility to parent his parent. That's why it's called parental inversion. Parental inversion creates in the person who is parentally inverted a lot of trouble. Now we'll talk about that. And it creates sinful patterns within the heart that have to find their death on the cross. But it becomes difficult to hate those sinful patterns because the parentally inversion, inverted person is trying to help people. The parentally inverted person is trying to honor the father and the mother by serving. But any time a child takes over the job of a parent, even if his motives are perfectly good, it's still usurpation. He's still usurping the function that belonged to another. And any time that happens, there is trouble. So it's sometimes difficult to get a parentally inverted person to see that what he did was sin because he was trying to help. And his motives, on the one side, were very good. You know, if I don't do it, this family's going to fall apart. And so you have to help him to see that, yes. Yeah, if one parent divorces and leaves, we're forced to do it by that parent. Yes, the same thing. See, the, the motive of the child standing up to become the strong one is good on the one side. But any time that we are put in the position of doing something that is not our job, we are actually usurping the position of the one who should have done it. And that creates great damage. Yes. She said that her mother had, what, nine children? And uh, the older sister took over. That's very common. Let me go on with the lesson, and then uh, we'll see if you can uh, understand and maybe ask some questions. First, we need to understand what the Bible does say about parenting. Parents are supposed to take responsibility for the children. Parents, parents are supposed to be the mature ones, they are the ones who are to put an ambience of protection about the family. They are the ones who are to make it secure for the children to grow up. And the scripture talks about that. In 2 Corinthians 12, 14, in the New American Standard Version, they are to take full responsibility for the children to bear their burdens, and it says it this way. Here, for this third time, I am ready to come to you. This is Paul speaking as a father to these converts. And I will not be a burden to you, for I do not seek what is, is yours but you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. You see it again in 1 Timothy 3, 4. They are to provide appropriate boundaries and discipline. He, the deacon, must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Now, I want to take a little time aside here to talk with you about teenage. How many of you have had a teenager? How many of you had a lot of trouble? <laughs> teenage was not a problem during biblical days. It's a modern problem. In biblical days, as soon as the son could work alongside of his father, 
he would be out in the field or in the shop, whatever he was, carpenter like Joseph or Jesus, and uh, the son would be working alongside the father, and he'd be learning how to do a task. He'd be being equipped to support a family, and he did that until he was 12 or 13. At 12 or 13 would be held the bar mitzvah. The bar mitzvah was the rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. And after the bar mitzvah, God would regard that one as a young adult. If, if the child did something wrong before 12 or 13, God would come to the father and discipline the father. But if after the bar mitzvah, if the child did something wrong, God would come directly to the child because he now regards that one as a young adult. And so when the scripture says that a deacon must know how to manage his household well, keeping his children in subjection, it's not talking about teenagers. And what has happened, you see, in teenage, young people must do two things. They must internalize and they must individuate. To individuate means they have to cut the apron strings and stand on their own feet and say, I'm my own person. I got to make some of my own decisions here. I got to decide what's right for me. I got to be the arbiter of my own morality. No longer you. I have to take responsibility for my decisions. I have to be a man. That's individuation. And the problem is you, just that you exist. <laughs> You're in the way. And uh, the second thing he must do is internalize. And that means that everything that has been taught to him, he must mull on it, ponder it. He has to do what Mary did. Mary kept all these things in her heart and pondered them. He has to make them his own. And again, the problem is he's living in your home. See, in biblical days, by the time a young man was 16, he most likely would be married. And by the time he was 13, he was regarded as an adult. Now what happens is <laughs> a kid hits teenage, the hormones turn on, the brains fall out. <laughs> and he's still living in your home. <laughs> And he's got to try to be a young man while he's still under your authority. And all of this is a way of leading up to say that Christians have often been worse parents of teenagers than have non-Christians. Because non-Christians don't try so hard. And Christian parents try too hard, and then they use this scripture that deacons must know how to manage their own household well, keeping their children in submission, and they apply that to the teenager, and they don't understand that's biblically wrong. See? In the Bibli biblical Bible days, a 13-year-old was no longer a child. He was now regarded as a young adult. So that scripture doesn't apply there. And what does apply is in Luke 15. When the prodigal son came to the father and said, Give me my share of what is mine, he let him go, knowing He'd squander it. He let him go, knowing it's the only way he could grow up and mature. See, we're not talking permissiveness. We're just talking about wisdom and knowing that a teenager has to make his own way mentally and emotionally. Now, I don't have time to give you. Maybe later on, if we come back to it, I can give you the whole teaching on how to handle a teenager. But all I wanted to make clear here when we're talking about the function of parents to put ambience, to put security, to put strength, to provide for, to be the mature ones for children, is that when that scripture says that he must manage his own household well, keeping his children in subjection, it's not talking about teenagers. So don't clamp down hard rules on teenagers because you'll force them from individuation to rebellion. She said, what about, it? what about it when you see a kid who is 14 or 15 and he has no maturity and he wants to stay with other kids and scripture says bad company ruins with good morals and you're scared stiff. We used to worry because 
it seemed to us that our kids always wanted to run with the orangutans. You know what an orangutan is? That's a kid whose hair is all messed up, always has something dangling out of his mouth, doesn't know how to stand up straight, says, what's up, man? That's a orangutan. <laughs> and now let me give you a hard one. What has happened in our culture is that we have abdicated the position of teaching. Sometime I'm, later on, I'm going to get to parental inversion, but we seem to be getting here right now. Do you remember when the... Uh, let's back all the way up. You wouldn't have picked each other out to be married to each other. The father of the groom and the mother of the groom write to a near relative and... Uh, they say, you have a daughter of marriageable age or near our son's age. Let's marry our kids to each other. And they always in Bible days picked out a near relative. And they married their son to a near relative. So Isaac was married to who? Come on. Rebecca, who was of his people. Jacob married two cousins. Abraham married his half-sister. Why? Because as the children go to sleep, they are taught by the mother. And you know that as you fall asleep, whatever you teach is what sticks in your mind. And a child is not considered weaned in Bible days until he's six. He's physically weaned at two, but he's not considered weaned until he knows all the prayers of the faith. This is why they always married a near relative, to be sure that the woman who trained their grandchildren would train them properly. And then at six, the children go to sleep alongside the father. And as the father goes to sleep, or they go to sleep, the father is teaching them about the faith. This is why Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8 so carefully say, teach your children diligently. And if you look up, the first seven chapters of Proverbs, you'll find that almost everyone begins, when I was a son to my father, he taught me and said, hold fast my words and live, for they are life to you. So the father would teach the children. Now do you remember when the man came knocking at the door at midnight and he said, a guest has come and I have to have three loaves of bread and I don't have any could I borrow from you you remember what he said I cannot get up and come down and give to you for I am in bed with the children we don't understand that but what that means is that time when the father was teaching the children was considered inviolate nothing must interrupt it and you must practice hospitality. So if a man comes and asks for three loaves of bread, and if a guest comes, you must have three loaves of bread for him, and this guy didn't have any, that isn't as important as the raising of those children, and he must teach his children. Now, what we have done is to abdicate the teaching to the Sunday school. And fathers don't know they have anything to teach anymore. Mothers don't know they have anything to teach. And so your teaching time for your children is from 0 to 12. By that time, that task is done or not done. So that when you let them go into teenage, if you've not put the deposit in them, you're going to reap trouble. You see that? Now, I've always said... You know, when Moses was challenged by rebellion, the scripture says he would fall on his face in prayer. So I've always said that you can recognize a Christian parent of teenagers by his flat face. <laughs> because he's going to fall on his face in prayer. And you're just reduced to prayer for those poor kids. <laughs> and you hope they get through teenage, teenage alive and with some semblance of morality. See? But your task was to teach in that period. And in this, we're really doing the preparatory work to teach you about parental inversion because that is what parents are supposed to do. They're supposed to provide that security, that love, that discipline, and that teaching 
which makes it safe for a child to be a child. Children need to be children. Okay? Good for you. He said, the young man is free to leave the home, and um, he may do so rather quickly. By the way, you remember, after Jesus bar mitzvah in the temple, since he was now a man, he was free to stay in the temple. His parents lost him, hunted for him three days. Now Mary is disturbed, so she says to him, what were you doing, in effect, you know? And his answer was, Woman, that's the polite way to speak in the East. Woman, wished ye not, I must be about my father's business. Now, translated, what that really means is he was saying, Mom, you're out of line. I'm now an adult. You don't treat me that way and get off my back. See? Uh, the girl, however, is she stays in the home. And she is also considered as a young adult. But in that culture, she might be married by the time she was 13 or 14. By the time she's 16, she's an old maid. By the time she's 18, she's confirmed spinster. See? So it's entirely different. Today, a kid has to go from the time his hormones turn on and his brains fall out for about six or eight years, maybe a dozen years, and he's not supposed to exercise those faculties until he's married. And he's living in your home trying to be an adult. So we have a built-in <laughs> teenage problem. Okay? I better get to talking about parental inversion so you can... Uh, all of that was just <laughs> off of that one uh, manage his own children with proper respect. 1 Timothy 5.8 If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it's parents who are to provide for the children. Proverbs 22, 6. I want to spend some time on this one. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is another scripture we've tended to misunderstand because we put the accent, accent on the wrong syllable. And <laughs> so we miss it. We think it says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. And so we take that as our mandate to control the child, force him into the mold we want. That isn't what that scripture means. Listen to it. Train up in the way the, a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Being a parent calls us to death on the cross so that we can see into the child, into what God wants that child to be, and call forth what God designed for that child to be. And when the child is called forth to be who he's to be, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. See, I'll give you an example. I was a weightlifter and an athlete. And I married Paula. And Paula is athletically built, strongly built. And Paula gave me four sons. So I want to have four football players. That's my boy running down that field for a touchdown. But Paula is an artist and a musician. So I got four strong sons, all artists and musicians. <laughs> so I have to die to what I want. <laughs> I can't crush them forward into being what I want. I've got to die to what I want, see what God wants, and bring that forth. And when that is brought forth, because it is who they are, they'll not depart from it. See? Train up a child in the way he should go. It also includes train up a child in the way God wants him to go. It means teaching morality and ethics and all the rest of it. But that has to be taught in such a way that they make it their own. What tends to happen is that we try to control, domineer, push, because we don't trust God with our children to make them be what they should be, that we think they should be. And then when they rebel, we can't understand. I gave them everything. Well, you gave them everything but them. 
He didn't set them free to be their own person. And so they don't want to be in your faith because it's your faith. It isn't their faith. See, All six of our children are Holy Spirit filled and serving the Lord. But we set them free. We tried not to trap them in our spirituality. We tried to provide for them a good, wholesome, secure, earthly, I didn't say worldly, earthly environment for them to grow up so that they could respond to God's call and it would be their response, not acting out what dad and mom are. It would be their own. And they're all securely walking in their own. See? Okay, now, one or two more scriptures and we'll go on about parental inversion. In Isaiah 38, 19b, the Father shall make known your truth to the children. That is, Father God's truth to the children. Now, what happens in parental inversion is that the parents do not provide all that that we've just been talking about in one way or another, or many ways. Maybe one of them is filled with vice. Maybe one of them is a model you can't follow. Maybe one of them is immature. Maybe one of them is alcoholic. Maybe one leaves the home, or both. And then what happens is that one of the children takes responsibility to be the parent for his parent and for the other children. And that causes the child to enter into fear. Who will take care of things? I have to do it. The child enters into striving. He's trying to be grown up before he's ready to be grown up. His childhood is raped. The child becomes proud of his adult role, built into him by the parent who needs him. Well, I can count on you. Well, you get the typical thing in the Western movie, and the rancher is shot down in a gun battle on the street, and while he's dying, he looks up to his son and says, now you must be the man of the house. And he becomes the man of the house. And he must be the man of the house. But there's a terrible cost to him. It's destroying him. Now what happened in my case was that I had a very good father in my formative years. I'm so grateful for what he was in my formative years. But he lost it by the time I was 10. He had a business, and a man in his employ embezzled. They indicted my father. It took everything that they had saved to clear his name. And then the court said, you have to pay back all that money that was embezzled. They thought he'd just take bankruptcy. They expected him to. But my father was a very honorable man. He went to work in two war plants, eight hours in each, 16 hours a day. and. All that money went to paying that back. And we lived on what I could raise in the garden, and at that time, Osage Indian money that came from Osage Indian oil wells was down to about 100 a month. And so on that 100 a month and what I could raise, we lived. My mother <coughs> was a hypochondriac, uh, was um, a very spoiled rancher's daughter, selfish and self-centered, and uh, so it all my older brother had gone by then in a teenage rebellion. It all fell on me when I was about 10. I became the strong one for my mother to lean on. I became her counselor. I became my father's counselor when he was weak and needed to talk. I became the strong one for my younger sister, four years younger. I became the strong one for my younger brother, 10 years younger. Years later, my sister had married a man in Joplin, Missouri, and I came back from the Northwest to visit with her, took her out to supper. She said, did you know I was mad at you? I said, no, what were you mad at me for? Said, you were my father, and you went off to college and left me. I said, how did I get in that position? I had usurped my father's place. And then my younger brother moved out to the northwest to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where we live, and across town, came to me for counseling. Said, do you know I was mad at you? I said, no, what were you mad at me for? 
said, you were my father. You went off to college and left me. And I thought, how did I get in that position? See, that's usurpation. I had taken my father's place. Now, never mind that he couldn't fill it and that somebody had to do it. When you get into the wrong position, it's sin. You, always, you need to understand that the church has always delineated two kinds of sin, conscious intended sin and unconscious unintentional sin. So what I was in was unintentional sin. I was in the wrong place. Now, that was at a great cost to me. I'm going to list some of them. You just take down the symptoms. The first thing it does to a parentally inverted child, it is it robs the child of ability to trust. To trust adults, to trust God, to trust authority figures. You see, the authority figures in his life have proved to be immature, have proved to be weak. He's got to be the strong one. And the question always is, where was God? Why wasn't God there to protect my family? Why do I have to do what God isn't doing? See, I was fond of saying, well, I know God causes the garden seeds to grow, but you should have seen the garden when God had it alone. <laughs> you understand that one? <laughs> Any parentally inverted person would understand that. And <laughs> so... I couldn't trust God. I had to do it for him. Next thing. It causes the parentally inverted person to be unable to rest. He cannot let down and rest. He's got to be alert at all times. See, I had to be alert at all times as a kid. When I'm not ready for that responsibility, I have to be alert in case some quarrel breaks out in the family so I can mediate between my mother and my younger brother or younger sister and even between my mother and my father so I can mediate I've got to be alert so I can't rest and fathers and mothers are supposed to build an ambience of rest a, an ambience of security this wasn't built so then there is no rest so I can't rest Hebrews 4 9 and 10 there remaineth a Sabbath rest unto the people of God, and he that hath entered into his rest ceases from his works as God did from his. I couldn't cease from my works because, you see, if I let down the whole world to go into chaos, you know, the whole world go in chaos. Um, the base of a parentally inverted person is fear. Fear. But it's fear of chaos. Now, there are performance-oriented people and parentally inverted people. A performance-oriented person has accepted a lie. I'm not going to be loved unless I can do enough work to earn my worth. I've got to, I've got to work to belong. And he's accepted that lie at the very core of his being, so he's working. E even though people love him, he's still working, so they'll love him. And he thinks he's got to do this. So the base of a performance-oriented person is fear. But there's a difference. He has fear that if he doesn't do right, he won't be loved. That's not the base in a parentally inverted person. He has fear that if he doesn't serve the family, the family is going to go into chaos. So they're both motivated by fear, but the parental inverted person has a different kind of fear. The parentally inverted person becomes very controlling. He controls all the people around him. <laughs> it was so bad in my case, being so tremendously parentally inverted, that the family would sit down to play cards. And after a while, the family would say to me, Dad, we could all put our cards down and leave the table, and you'd go right on playing all every hand here. I was always controlling. See, it had to be done excellently. It had to be done right. Keep chaos out, see? People around, parentally inverted people, don't grow up. Because 
A parentally inverted person learns to define himself as a strong one, helping those that are weaker. And when and then he can't assign a task and just let it go and trust them to do it or fail. He'll overmanage, over control, and then if they don't do it, he'll step in and say, Well, I guess I gotta do it myself. Then he becomes the noble martyr. Why isn't anybody helping? How come I gotta do everything around here? And the people around him become fumble fingered because he can't trust them and let them go to make mistakes and learn. He's got to overmanage and control. One young man said to me, John, how come I know as long as I'm counseling with you, I'm not going to get well? I said, what? He says, I, I just know as long as I'm counseling with you, I'm not going to get well. That drove me to the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord said, John, you defined yourself as a strong person helping weaker people. And thereby, you know yourself as a loving person. So you can't let your counselee get well because he wouldn't need you anymore. Parentally inverted people have learned to need to be needed. They need to be needed. Yes. The ADOC thing, adult children of alcoholics. No, ADOA. ACOA. <laughs> ACOA. Adult children of alcoholics. Uh, what can happen when, the, say, the mother is alcoholic? Various of the children at different times can take over the role of being parentally inverted. Both. Yes. Parentally inverted make dependent people. People become dependent upon them. And then the parentally inverted person complains because they aren't growing up. And they're being dependent. Oh, yeah. You can be both performance-oriented and parentally inverted. And you can switch roles back and forth. So for a while, you're going to be performance-oriented, then you've got to be parentally inverted. <laughs> <laughs> so you're apt to be all those things. Next symptom is a lot more damaging, and that is that the parentally inverted person learns to be a loner. He becomes incapable of sharing his secrets and his problems with somebody else. And especially, he cannot be corporate with his wife or she with her husband, cannot. Usually because the parentally inverted person had such a relationship I learned I could not share my problems with my mother. I could listen to her problems. I could not share mine with hers because <laughs> Women have ele elephantine memories, and everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And she would use that against me, anything I shared. So I learned you don't share with the primary woman. Now, guess what that did with marriage? What it did with marriage is that parentally inverted people are apt to become, fall into spiritual adultery. Now, spiritual adultery occurs whenever you give to someone other than your spouse the position of the being the one to comfort you. See, the Holy Spirit's the first comforter, but the Holy Spirit decides to comfort through the spouse most often, first. So what would happen is, while I was a child, I couldn't find comfort. You don't learn to find comfort in the home because that's the place of responsibility. You come into the home, you go into gear. So you don't learn that the home is the place of refreshment. It's the place of responsibility. You go into gear. So then I would go out and find comfort with my collie dog and with my cow. They love me, and they never talk back. They just loved up on me. That meant that when I got married, and I'm in the pastorate, and I should be talking with Paula, 
I don't talk with her because I've learned that the woman will rip you up, and I've learned that the place of the home is not the place of security. This is all a lie, but that's what I've learned. And so what I did, I'd go out and I would call on the older women and older men in the church, ostensibly for their sake, but it was really so I could lay my burdens on them. And they would listen to me, and those old folks would just love up on me. See, I had grandmothers that I could talk with. So I learned to do that. And so that was spiritual adultery because I was giving to those people the position that belonged to my wife. See? Yes. Good question. Suppose that the spouse you're living with is abusive, very dangerous to share with that one, and sharing with that one is like giving the other a sword and saying you put it in here and you twist. And so you've learned you can't do that. Well, then what do you do? You just die? Well, you can have a prayer partner, and it is tinged with spiritual adultery, but do not give up on the spouse. Find refreshment, but don't have just one prayer partner. Be in a group. Be in a church. Find your refreshment, then come back and keep trying to love your partner to life. See, don't give up on the spouse. That then puts you into spiritual adultery. Because now you've given up and you're, you're no longer, your heart's closed towards your spouse, and you're going to find security and warmth and love out here. That's spiritual adultery. I'm going to say something really tough to you and see if you can hold it in balance. You actually can commit spiritual adultery with the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't his fault. But what you do then, if you close your heart to your spouse, you give to the Lord what belongs to your spouse. Understand that one? And that's spiritual adultery. I was doing that with the Lord. I was a devotional mystic, and I could soar right up to him. And then there came a day when he said, John, I'm not going not to let you come into my presence for a while because you've got to learn to find nurture humanly first. See, in my case, I had to do that because I was in spiritual adultery. See, that's what parentally inverted people get into. It. Many, many pastors are parentally inverted people. They've learned to shepherd and take care of other people. But if you have a parentally inverted pastor, the congregation doesn't mature because he's got to over-shepherd. And he smothers. And he controls. And he needs to be needed. See? What's the answer? <laughs> Die. <laughs> die to that thing on the cross. Let me see. I think I may have listed most of the symptoms. Let's see if I missed a couple of them here. Uh, there may be sexual dysfunction. Because it may be very difficult for the parentally inverted person either not to put his wife in the position of being a younger sibling that he takes care of, and you don't make love to a sibling, or put her in the position of the mother. And you have to watch out if he starts calling her mom, mama, it's just a little bit of advice, anyway, in marital counseling. Don't call your spouse mama. Don't call your spouse papa. That sets up a wrong thing in your psyche. And you don't make love to your parent. See? Now, I would be out there talking to these other people, and then in the church, there'd be a young couple who would be 
safe and secure, so I'd be sharing my heart with them. I hadn't shared it with Paula. Paula would overhear that. She would be terribly hurt. She'd say to me in private, she'd get after me, and she'd say, John, I don't want to be the last one to know what's going on in your heart. I want to be the first one. Someday you'll know I'm the best friend you've got. But you see the hurt I was doing? Because I was not able to share with her. The next thing that happens to parentally inverted people is that they may turn off their emotions. Now let me explain what, it, what happens. As a kid, if trouble arose in the family when I'm a kid, a normal kid should be allowed to experience all the emotions that are involved in whatever trauma is going on in the family. Should be able to do that. And, and those emotions are good, and the parents should be strong so that the parents can come, and when the child is emotional and comfort or helping put it in balance, but in a parentally inverted situation, there's nobody to help put them in balance. And in the first place, they have to be the strong one. So what I did, whenever there was trauma in the home, I would just turn off my emotions. Just turn them off. And then I would handle it logically for the rest of the family. Calm and cool and collected. Now that would seem to be good. But once you build a structure in you, that thing keeps on living beyond its usefulness. And then what happened was, in adulthood, somebody would say something to me and it should make any normal person mad. And he should take action. He should rebuke back, you know. Luke 17, 3, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. But that goes with Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if one among you be overtaken in a stress, trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of gentleness. And it goes with Proverbs 15, 1, which says... Uh, a soft answer, a harsh word stir up, uh, stirreth up wrath, but a soft answer brings healing. Well, I couldn't respond as I should have. I wasn't real. People would say a hard word to me, and they actually would have felt loved if I'd said a hard word back. You understand that one? I would have been meeting them at the level that they had engaged me. But instead, I was withdrawing from them, turning it off, and handling it logically. Then, about three, four hours later, it's bubbling up. Now I know what I should have said to that guy. Now I'm making up speeches. I, I've, I've got the perfect squelch now. I wish I had him back here. Now I know I'm angry. But it's too late. <laughs> and now it's gone inside my heart, and it's festering in there. Because I didn't handle it when I should have. See, Scripture says, be angry, but sin not, and let not the sun go down in your anger. See, anger's not bad. We in the church get confused, and we think anger is sin. Wrong. Scripture says, Jesus never sinned, and yet Scripture says, he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Jesus could get angry at the Pharisees. Jesus got angry at the guy that buried his talent. So anger is not sin. It's what you do with anger that becomes sin. In my case, it became sin because I didn't handle it. And it went into the heart. And now I'm mulling. And my heart is fuming. See, that's what happens to a prevent parentally inverted person. He doesn't handle things really or in, in real meeting with the other person. He withdraws. And... I was so determined not to hurt because I had learned in my family that it was hurtful and so you don't hurt anybody that if Paula said something instead of answering back immediately I would go to pondering pondering and I'm trying to figure out how to say something that will help her you know I've got to be the parentally inverted person to help her I got, I'm trying to figure out how to do that and Paula then would say to me I wish you would give me something raw once. I just get the polished, finished product. As I said yesterday, she'd say, you quit sitting there in that hole looking like a martyr and come out here and fight with me. <laughs> See? <laughs> but I was so controlled, I couldn't do that. 
lost, parentally inverted people become lost from their own emotions. They don't know any longer what they feel because they have turned it off in order to control the family, keep chaos out of the family. Okay, now we're going to take it one step deeper. Sometimes what happens in parental inversion is that one of the children, one of the parents is gone, either uh, emotionally gone and or physically gone. And then one of the children steps in to take that one's place emotionally. That is called substitute mate. Becomes a substitute mate. So suppose it's the, f I, I got into this with my mother. Suppose that the father is gone and my father was gone more than 16 hours a day. He had to drive to one off one f war factory and then another and then drive home. So every day he was gone at least 18 hours and then he's so tired he just falls in bed. And uh, so he wasn't there. And so the mother look to someone to talk with, someone to lean on. She is putting me in the position of a husband without the bed. She consults with me about the younger children, see? She gives me responsibility for handling the younger children that belongs to the father. Some young men, I didn't get into this, but some young men go to work and they become the breadwinner for the family, which is what the father does. Uh, they become everything that the father is except the bed. Now what ha happens then, I'll just tell you by a story. We had some friends, uh, the woman was one of the most beautiful women I ever saw. In fact, they took us to a hotel where stars come and when they came in every eye riveted on her because they thought she had to be a star well her husband had left her and he left just when her son was coming into puberty and in puberty the sexual hormones turn on and now he steps in to be the strong one for his mother with the younger child and so she has put him in position as a husband without the bed. Now you men, put yourself in position here. You're a kid, your hormones have just turned on. You can hardly keep yourself away from pornography in the first place. <laughs> I'm just joking. And, and now, here is this gorgeous woman who's relating to you as a husband. What do you have to do? You have to say, turn off. Don't think sexually, this is mother. Don't think sexually, this is mother. Unfortunately, uh, in Japan, what is happening now is that the companies are making the men work so much that many young boys have been put in that position with the with their mother, the wife, and there is actual incest now going on in some cases. But so he had to turn off. Then later on, when he grew up, he found a very beautiful young gal. They married. They had a wonderful sexual relationship. And then she became a mother. And all of a sudden, he couldn't make love to her anymore. He just could not make himself touch her physically. And he kept thinking, you can't make love to her. You think too much of her. You respect her too much. You understand what's happened? When she became a mother, she triggered into his turn-off mechanism. And so it automatically says, shut down. You can't think this way. This is mother. So we brought him in and talked with him about all this, enabled him to forgive his father for leaving the home, enable him to forgive his mother for putting him in that position. See, we're not talking about conscious sin. We're talking about just mistakes that people make without intending to hurt each other. Forgive her for doing that. 
Now, Lord, bring that turn-off mechanism to death. Let the sword of truth cleave between his wife and his mother, so that in the depths of him he knows this is his wife and not his mother. Set him free from this thing, from this lie, Lord. Loose him from this lie. And about two weeks later, we got a letter from him and from his wife, and she was just chortling with glee. She said, oh, thank you, thank you, I've got my husband back. And he was saying, thank you, I can make love to my wife again. See? That's the damage, or a part of the damage, that can happen from parental inversion. Then the next part that happens is that when he or she does marry, may not be able to let go of the parent. See, Scripture says in Genesis 2, 26 and again, uh, 24, and then it's said again in Ephesians 5, 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, two shall become one. But the substitute mate one may not be able to leave home, can't let go of mama. See? It does other damage. I'll answer your question in a minute if you had back there. Suppose it is, here's a case, the mother flaked out. She just lay on the couch and ate chocolate and watched TV all day. That's all she would do. The young son becomes ashamed because she doesn't do the housework, she doesn't make the bed, she doesn't sweep the floors, she doesn't prepare the meals, and he was afraid to bring any guests home for fear they'd see the mess. So then he decided, I'll take over. And so he did the house cleaning, and he did the cooking, and he did all of that. He became his father's wife in every way but the bed. And what this did was to raise in him feminine attributes. <laughs> he was not an effeminate man, but he had some feminine attributes after a while. And then what happened was when he got married, he couldn't let his wife be the wife. He would come home, go in the bathroom, take everything out of the cupboard under the sink, rearrange it, clean it all off, put it back in. Then he'd go along over the, the transom and over the window sills and wipe to see if there was any dust up there. And he'd clean it up. And you'd think, well, this'd be wonderful. She's got a helper. But what he was doing was putting her down. He was saying, I can be at a better housewife than you can. Because he had a judge, his mother, judge his wife, put her in the same position. I can out, I can out housewife you. <laughs> See, and she was just furious. So we had to break that whole thing. Enable him to forgive his mother. Enable him to forgive his father for letting him be in that position. Bring to death that whole lie he swallowed that he's got to be the housewife. He's got to out housewife her. Bring it all to death. Set him free. Sometimes. The father is gone, and an older girl steps in to be the substitute mate. And the, other gr the older girl may actually uh, develop masculine traits of authority. Uh, mas men, men express authority differently than women. Uh, a man in authority may just say, cut that out. And a woman say, may say, uh, you don't want to do that, do you? <laughs> And so she would learn to express authority in a masculine way. And she would learn masculine traits, taking care of the younger children for her mother, being the man of the house for her mother. Then when she got married, I'm talking about an actual case, when she got married, she couldn't let her husband be the head of the house. She's going to out-masculine him. Because <laughs> that's what's built into her as a substitute mate. See? So it can happen a number of ways. Uh, a boy stepping in to be the mother, or stepping in to be the husband, a girl stepping in to be the father, or the confidant, or whatever. And every time that happens, it does bring trouble, because it builds structures inside that need to come to death on the cross. Now we had a question over here. Can there be any sexual function with that, meaning 
the case of the girl who steps in. Yes, we had a case of a woman who could not let her husband make love to her. She had to be the dominant one making love to him. So she couldn't let him make love to her. She couldn't let him be fully masculine. There's a sense of taking and possessing and being owned on the woman's part. And she couldn't let that happen. She had to possess him. She made love to her husband in a masculine way. See? Ah, she said, can you have both? Said her father uh, had to go to war and her mother was breaking down being an alcoholic. So who became the strong one? Your sister. Yeah. So the o older sister took over, maybe the older brother. What happens then, in the s younger siblings there comes a confusion because they, the younger siblings find themselves loving the older sibling as they should love the father or the mother. And they give the loyalty and the belonging and the obedience and everything else that belongs to mom and pop to the brother or the sister, which is also not good for them and becomes confusing. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. She is saying that there's a girl whose parents are incapable, divorced, what? Divorced and the mother's living with another person. This, woman, this girl is living with her and uh, she finds herself wanting to mother her. Ooh, in one sense that's not bad. This girl desperately needs to have a mother. On the other, you're put in the position of usurping the mother. So the best thing you can do is to talk with the mother and say, your daughter is staying with me, and uh, I, 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 I love to have her there, but it puts me in a mother position. Would you allow me to be that way to her? The original, the original decision to usurp the parents' authority, it's not a decision. It's done at levels below conscious will most of the time. You just find yourself being in that position because that one is either weak or incapable or gone. And so you find yourself doing it. You didn't decide to do it. You just found yourself in that position. Or you may have decided to help but help took that that form see so it isn't that you decided to usurp most of the time most of the time it's just that doing it caused you to be usurping yeah okay you're in a home where one, it's a single parent home, and then is, is the single parent not functional? And then you're one of the children. See, here's the, the bad thing. Uh, you want to respond to God's call to be a servant and to be a helper. And so you want to step in to help. Well, there's almost no way you can do that without getting the flip side. <laughs> without usurping, without uh, all the harm done to you as it was done to me, see? You, you just, there's no way you can do it. So you need to forgive yourself and be compassionate towards yourself and go on and, and step in and help in whatever way you can. 
I'm saying it's unavoidable. Uh, maybe Dr. Mullen has a, have you got a thought there? Is there a way she can do that without stepping in it? Yeah. So you give her a pill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this parentally inverted person will take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. There. In other words, there are some situations that are inherently unclean and they can't be avoided. Here's a couple of them, and the scripture for that is uh, Proverbs 4.14, or it could be 14.4. Anyway, it says, where no oxen are, the manger is clean, but where the oxen is, there's much increase. You understand that? Where the oxen is, they're going to poop. So you got a mess, but they're going to do a lot of work for you. So when a pastor, for example, or a counselor I sit down to counsel with a woman. She hasn't been able to talk with her husband. He just is a klutz. He won't listen. And she's lonely. And she's hurting. So she comes to me for counsel. I'm sitting there. I'm a man. And I'm hearing her. And this is so tonic to her heart. What does she do? Spiritual adultery towards me. Now, what am I to do? Not counsel her? It's unclean. But what I try to do then is several things. One, try to be transparent so she gets quickly past me to the Lord and to her husband. Second, get somebody else counseling in with me, preferably another woman. Third, counsel with the door open. Fourth, tell my wife I'm in this sticky situation and pray protection for me. See. But that's a way of saying to you that you can get into situations that are just inherently sticky. And so if you're in a situ if you grew up in a situation where have a divorced home and uh, the mother is um, by herself but she's flaky and you got younger siblings or even older, you may have to become the one who steps in to be the strong one for the protection of the others. God wants to honor you. God is proud of you. God is pleased with you. And on the other hand, God grieves for you because you've been put in a position that is basically sinful. You're usurping somebody else's position. And it's doing great harm to you. So God wants to minister to you. In a little while, we're going to tell you what to do to get a parentally inverted substitute made person out of it. Right now, we've got more questions. Yes. Yes, there is. He's yeah. He said they have, they adopted a child at three months, and now they're the parents, but the other parents are living, so in a sense they are usurping. There is a way. Now there are counseling. A there are adoption agencies and churches that are getting wiser. And when there is a case of somebody who will carry a child and not be able to keep it, when they can, they'll get the prospective adoptive parents together with that mother, and uh, they even may have her come and stay with them for a while. And they get to know her, and they get to know each other. And then she formally releases in prayer her child to them. So now they're not usurping. And uh, they give her permission to come and see the child every once in a while. So they're working it out in ways that can be blessing in every case. It was back here. Yes. 
He's ta- yeah, he's talking about growing up in a home where both were, I think you said alcoholic, just your dad, but your mother was... She couldn't function. Okay. Did you become parentally inverted toward the other children? Yeah. One of the damages that can happen, whether you become parentally inverted in a situation like that or not, is just exactly what you described. In order to be able to function, you turn off the emotions towards the parents. And... uh, any time you turn off emotions and you build a wall, first, that damages you, but second, that wall won't stay in place. And that wall gets between you and everybody else, and including God. And therefore, you have to repent and pray with people, and you may have to pray a number of times for your own emotions to be resurrected. What you're dealing with is a flight mechanism, a hiding place, so you won't have to feel. And as I said yesterday, sometimes when there is so much trauma in the family, we have within us what is called a homeostatic principle, which is a body wisdom. And so that homeostatic principle will say, turn it off, shut it down, it hurts too much. So it shuts the emotions down, and it can even, if it's it's like uh, an abuse, say forget it then you can't remember it and that is at the moment a protection but later on it's very damaging because that stuff is now fermenting inside and hasn't been handled but what it can do to you is prevent you from coming into the fullness of abundant life because you it's all blocked off so what you have to do is get with enough people often enough where you bear yourself often enough that they keep praying for that to be brought down and get into as many times as you can get into a, a renewal meeting and renewal worship until the Lord can just override the dam you know, and break through for you. Yes, parental inversion and PO are similar but different. Pray for P.I. first and then P.O. Pray for whatever the Holy Spirit prompts is ripe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, God is writing a book, and it's called The Slow Dyers. And we're it. (laughs) We we don't die easy. (laughs) You see... We are created in the image of God, and he created us to be free with free will like he has. That means then that everything we create within us also has free will. So when we create a practice in the old nature, that has a life of its own and a will of its own, and it doesn't want to die. One person had a T-shirt that said, the trouble with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. (laughs) So, we keep crawling off the altar, you know. We don't want to die. That thing in us doesn't want to die. It has a life of its own. And here's this. One reason we don't want to let it die is this issue of control. It may be misery, but at least we're familiar with it. You know that song... Take my hand, I'm a stranger in paradise. Well, we're all strangers in paradise. Listen to the scripture for this one. The scripture is, Who through fear of death, I think this is Hebrews 2.15, but you can look it up. Who through fear of death were kept in lifelong bondage. We don't fear physical death. That's a hallelujah. The death we fear is the death to ourself and death of control. So then we choose our bondage again and again because we're afraid to die to it because then we wouldn't be in control and we wouldn't know how to live as this new creature. So we keep running back into the old way again. 
See? Yes. Are there special problems of children of inverted parents? You should ask my kids. <laughs> <laughs> They'll tell you jokes about dad. And uh, they don't have some problems in that a parentally inverted person is determined to be there for his kids. He's not going to be like his parents were. He's going to be there for them. But because he's judged the parents for being gone or flaking out, then he does the same in other ways. So there were ways I was not present to my kids while I was being present to them. And they would feel that. And they tell me, they have told me, Dad, I couldn't get to you. What do you mean I was always there? No, I couldn't get to you. Why? Because my heart was hidden. Because it was so guarded. And I judged my father and mother, so I do the same to them. See? So they have problems with parentally inverted parents. That's just some of them. <laughs> One of them is that they are overmanaged. Like, um, my kids would complain. I go out to teach them to do something. And I, they're starting to do it. And then I see their mistakes, so I take it over. Now I do the whole thing while they watch. And they're mad. They never got to learn. They got squelched. Because Dad did it all. See? And when they grew older, they began to tell me about that. See? I didn't let them be free to make their own mistakes because I had to control to protect them from harm. Thank God I wasn't completely amniotic, that is, build a safe walls of the womb all around them. What's a child do about the... Yeah. If the child is secure enough, if enough love has been given, the, the child can tell his dad what he's doing. My kids have. In fact, they love to tell dad off. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> if not, the kid just suffers in silence, and then the whole pattern is perpetuated with the next generation. <laughs> yeah. She said, I guess I'll stop and give the rest of them. She said that uh, she's one of five, four brothers. She's one right in the middle. But the parents reversed the roles in that they expected the kids to, what, step and fetch it? Do everything for them? Yeah. My mother was the consummate step and fetch it. My, I'll, I'll tell you what my mother did. Sends me out to work hoeing the corn. So I and my brother are out there hoeing the corn. She walks past the kitchen sink to the screen door and calls out, Boys, we answer, come and get me a drink of water. <laughs> she, she would turn us into being step and fetch it slaves. <laughs> What's that do to the children? Yeah, it makes them very mad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the scripture says, fathers do not provoke your children to anger. And uh, it should be parent mothers too. I, I will tell you another thing here, and then I'll answer your question. What tends to happen also is that a child will protect one parent from himself and hate the other one. You know, obviously hate. I mean, be angry at, uh, see all the bad things. Now, what happened was, my mom was so bad, I saw all the bad things about her, but dad was a hero. Then later on, see, this is not healthy. And health comes when you begin to see that neither one is a saint and the other one a sinner. They're both saint and sinner. And they're both culpable. Well, I had to see that I was really angry at my dad because he didn't stop my mother. 
He didn't protect me from her. He didn't take over. I now know if dad, dad was so gentle, if he had not been so gentle. You see, you got gentleness is still flesh. You've got to bring it to death on the cross so that when God wants you to be stern, you can be stern. And my father, if he had said one time, Zelma, now cut that out. Zelma would have just settled right down. That's what she wanted. But he would never express that. At all. I remember, <laughs> I got, I got, you know, I told you yes, some of them yesterday how the Lord used humor sometimes with us. Well, I was that way. I couldn't just say a sharp word of command to Paula, and she really wanted me to. There were times her emotions would run amok, and she wanted me to say, now, Paula, take hold of that. And she would have rested. But I was so gentle, you know, that I couldn't do that. Well, we went to uh, Haver, Montana. That's way up near the Canadian border, and it's right in the coldest area. I mean, it was so cold, it was 60 degrees below zero, and the snow crunched when you walked on it. Got done, and we're driving home. And Paula's had an accident on ice, and so she's, all, she's at me. John, drive slower. I'm only going 20. Well, drive slower. <laughs> so we got into a fight. And we couldn't get all the way home. We got to Missoula and had to go in a motel, went out to supper, got back to the motel room, and we're still fighting. <laughs> she's still chewing on me, and I'm still fussing back at her. And finally, I got furious. Now, we sleep in the all together. So I bounded out of bed and all together, looked down at her and said, You're not going to do that to me again! And she started giggling. <laughs> I mean, it was a funny sight. Here I am in the moonlight, stark naked. You're not going to do that! <laughs> and then she started crying sweetly. And then she realized Her brothers would get into trouble, and her father would spank them and stop them. But she never got in trouble, never got stopped. And here I finally did it. <laughs> and she was crying tears of relief. <laughs> but you see, there was that being too gentle, which is what my father was. And so I had to learn to, f to see both sides that both were sinner and both were saint, and forgive both. I'm saying that for some of you because I know uh, a number of you may have done the same thing. You protected one parent from you, and the other parent was evil. And you don't get whole until you see that both of them were culpable, and both of them had good things, and you deal with it on the cross. Oh, yeah. Um, in my mother being sort of uh, emotionally incompetent, uh, able to do it. There was an inversion in terms of taking care of her. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's ground for uh, a lot of resentment and then later a lot of expectancy in, in your marriage. Yeah. When the son takes emotional responsibility for the mother, that builds in structures that will afflict his relation with his wife later. He may not be, he may have bitter root judgment expectancy that she will be emotionally incapable, and he may draw somebody that will prove that. <laughs> or if she happens to be emotionally strong, his bitter root judgment will drive her, defile her to become emotionally unstable. And uh, then he will placate control instead of meat. So a lot of damage can happen when that does happen. How many of those happened? Never mind. <laughs> um, my question to you is, um, in my um, early adult life, I manifested uh, an eating disorder because of the control. 
that I needed to hang on to. Is that common of um, children like this? And also, what, which of your books do you recommend for a person like myself? Answering the first question first, it's in The Transformation of the Inner Man, the chapter on parental inversion and substitute mate. Answering the second question, <coughs> men don't as often go into eating disorders. They may learn to eat to comfort themselves and uh, gain too much weight. I, I, I'd sort of do that. After I've spoken and poured myself out for the Lord, have a grand pity party. And then I comfort myself by eating a bowl of ice cream, you know. So men will do that, but women will get into disorders like bulimia or anorex anorexia bulimia. And uh, what we found usually behind those things is ungrieved grief and unadmitted guilt and or. And uh, once you get at the roots of those, sometimes you can set them free from that. Uh, we, it's uh, 401. I think we got a little more time. Okay. Um, discerning between honoring your parents and you read the scripture where the parents are responsible for the children, yet the Bible says if you don't um, take care of your parents in their old age, you're worse than an infidel. And just Balancing honor with letting them be. There's a good question, and uh, oh boy, if I were to give the whole teaching behind that, it takes another half hour. Let me see how shortly I can say it. Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a time for everything and everything in its season. So there's a time for honoring the parents as a child before you're 12. And that kind of honoring takes a different shape than when you're a teenager, and it takes a different shape when you are an adult. And when you become an adult, and especially when you receive Jesus, there is a need to cut free. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, when you were first married, didn't like to go home to visit in your parents' home because it felt like they were reducing you to being a child? Yeah. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, two shall become one. That's a three-stage process. You have to leave home. Now it's one thing to take the boy off the farm, it's another to get the farm out of the boy. So it's one thing to leave the home, another thing to get that relationship broken and changed. And if you don't do that, then you can't become one. Now, when you receive Jesus, there is a need to turn and cut free. Now, I want you to watch my hands. When you are born in the earth, your race, nationality, creed, and culture are all, and your family, they are all a womb in which your character is formed. It's all shot through with sin, so your character is shot through with sin. This is why you have to be born anew. When you're born anew, that's being born out of the womb that formed you. Now, if you don't turn and cut the umbilical cord, the old blood of the old life comes into the new. Or the old wineskin comes onto the new. So we're talking Luke 14, 26. He who comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, and child, and yea, his own life, cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus isn't going to ask anybody to hate wrongly. What he's talking about is hate the continuing carnal influence. So when I am born anew, then I have to cut free from everything that formed me. Now, I'll show it to you in several ways. First, I'm part Osage Indian, and I inherited the Indian side far more than anybody in the family, which meant that I had natural Indian mysticality. I'm a natural mystic. But after I came into the Holy Spirit, what would happen is that Osage Indian mysticality would rise up and act, and I didn't know the difference between it and what were the Holy Spirit's gifts. I could do things without the Lord. 
I had to then turn and renounce my Osage Indian heritage, cut free from it. See, I'm no longer first Osage. I am first son of God. I'm a new creature, born anew in Christ. So I cut free from the Osage Indian heritage. Now, it can't reach into me and use me anymore. But the Lord, when he wants to, can reach into it and use it. Here's an example. Brother pastor I love so dearly, Bernie Warfield, is a black guy. And uh, I love to hear him preach. But every once in a while, black bitterness had come out. And he heard this teaching. And so he said, in the name of Jesus, I renounce my blackness. I cut free from it. The very next day, the camp leaders ask him to be the song leader. And he turned us all gloriously black. I mean, we were singing like a black choir. We had rhythm. <laughs> it was glorious. But you see, now God could re reach in and use his blackness, but it couldn't reach in and use him. You see the difference? So this is one thing you need to do when you're born anew. Renounce your heritage. That doesn't mean that uh, you do away completely. It just means it can't influence you. Same thing with my mother. My mother would come to visit Mothers do those things that put sons under guilt and make them jump. And so my mother would just start doing those things, and I'd just subtly start becoming son to her rather than husband to Paula. i start making decisions about the day with her rather than consulting Paula. And i start making all kinds of other things with her rather than Paula. Paula's furious, can hardly wait for my mother to go home. So I learned this. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I cut every carnal tie between my mother and me. I cut free from her. She came to visit. She did the usual things that would usually make me jump. I didn't have to struggle against them. It just fell right off my back. She went home in a huff, thought I didn't love her anymore because I didn't play the old games. A couple of years later, she heard Tommy Tyson preach on the subject and understood it. See? So... What happens, couples that get married, and then they start fighting. Uh, we got to go home to be with my parents this Christmas. We went the last Christmas to yours. You know, or the husband keeps going home to take care of mama. Wrong. You got to cut free. You cut free. You can read about this in our book, Restoring the Christian Family, in the chapter... 18 called renunciation or cutting free so how many of you having been born anew have never turned in prayer and said i cut free yeah now we're going to pray that prayer but before we do it i want to take it one step deeper and if you're making notes write this down all uncrucified love Mother love, father love, husband, wife love, any kind of love. We learn to love in the world before we came to Jesus, and our ways of loving are shot through with sin. So all uncrucified love is use, manipulation, exploitation, possession, control, and demand. I'll run that by you again. <laughs> all love that hasn't died on the cross is use, manipulation, exploitation, possession, control, and demand. Now, Paul and I always had romance love, but we found, I found I couldn't be myself around her. I'd come home trying to figure out how to say things so I'd stay out of trouble. <laughs> and I'd come walking up the steps thinking, I'm going to go in there and sit down and I'm going to have a good talk with Paula. I'm going to listen to the problems. I'm going to be with her. I step in the door. Coming through the air without any words are these vibes. And they say, you come in here and talk to me, you dirty bum. And now the demand took the gift away. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paula's been at home all day. And she's thinking, hardly wait to get home, me get home. But she is going to give me some time to recollect myself. She's going to let me get lost in the television for a few minutes before she unloads all the problems of the day. And I come in the door. And coming from me without a word are these vibes. 
get out of my space, get out of my face, leave me alone. And the demand took away the gift. And here she comes. So, <laughs> it's a way of saying that all of our loving manipulates, controls. We have pictures of what they want the other one to be. And we push, pull, demand, control. So what we have to pray is very strange prayer. Lord, bring my love to death on the cross. Every way I love, bring it to death on the cross. Now you come, love through me. See, our love will imprison. Jesus' love will set free. And listen to the scripture behind this. Except a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die. Now hear this word. It remains alone. But if it falls into the earth and dies, it bears much fruit. See, I used to say to Paula, you got a carousel going and there's one spot open and I got to jump on on that. Or I don't love you. See? She was, t the only way I could relate was to be a satellite in her orbit. I didn't want to be a satellite in her orbit. So she remained alone. But when she died to all this, now I could be with her and be myself. So I wanted to be with her, and she wasn't alone anymore. And I had my carousel going. I had my parentally inverted demand going. And so she couldn't be her around me. See, I'll just tell you one more story, then we'll pray it. I had a couple come to me for counseling, and they said, John and Paula, we don't understand ourselves. Said we, we met as kids and we could share and we could talk and we could just unburden anything oh this is so wonderful i found my mate i found my spouse we got married said from the honeymoon on we couldn't share anything we felt imprisoned we felt measured we felt judged we felt controlled felt like we were in a trap we got divorced well we were still friends and after a while went out on a date we could talk we could share we could laugh. We could enjoy. We felt free with each other. We made a mistake. Let's get married. We married each other again. Immediately. We couldn't share. We couldn't talk. We felt imprisoned. We felt measured. We felt judged. We felt controlled. We got divorced again. Well, we were still friends. Went out on a date. We could talk. We could share. We could laugh. We got married again. We couldn't talk. We couldn't share. We were in prison. We got divorced. Well, now we're dating and we're having a marvelous time. What's the matter with us? Do you understand it? When they got married, they became primary to each other. And so all of the practiced ways of manipulating, controlling, pushing, pulling, measuring, demanding, all of that condemning, all of that took over. So they felt imprisoned. When they were divorced, they weren't primary, so now they could be friends. Have you noticed you can be nicer to other people than to your own? Because you're not risked. See? That is a way of saying to you what our love... Have you seen uh, a family in which there's a little old grandmother and she controls the whole roost and says to the men... I carried you nine months under my heart and delivered you in pain and you can't come over and mow my lawn on Sunday. <laughs> and she uses love to control them. Put them under guilt. Make them jump. See? So, what we have to do is to bring our love to death. And at the same time, let's pray, cutting free. Paula and I said, Lord, we cut free from each other. Bring our love for each other to death. You know what happened? Jesus, still in the love business, found ourselves more in love than ever before. But now, for the first time, get this, we were free to fail each other. Free to fail each other without being condemned, free to be ourselves, didn't have to put on airs to keep out of trouble, free just to be, because we were free from each other to be free to each other. Am I making sense to you now? Yeah. 
Are you ready to pray this? Okay, now wait a minute. Before we pray, I got to warn you. <laughs> I never know how anybody, how ripe anybody is to say this prayer. And after we say this prayer for the, several days, you might feel a bit numb and you might not feel anything. And you think, wait a minute, that was a wrong prayer to say. But remember, Jesus was three days in death before he rose. So for several days, you could just be dying. It's okay. So all the old ways of relating, the old ways of feeling may be dying, and you just don't feel what you used to feel. But after a few days, what will rise up is true love of Jesus through you for people, and it'll be glorious. But don't worry about those first few days if you just feel numb. And think, oh, I shouldn't have said that prayer. I'm numb. Okay? Let's bow in prayer. I'll ask you in a minute to repeat after me. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have created us for a relationship. We thank you that you have risked us with one another. We thank you, Lord, that you have created us for love. You didn't hatch us in the sea, but you gave us birth through a mother and under the parentage of a father. Lord, we thank you for all of that. But Lord, we now see that all the ways we love were built in us in the world before we came to you. And all our relationships and all of our history and culture that formed us were shot through with sin. And they still control us. And so we want to say to you, Lord Jesus, now repeat after me, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for love, but I see that my love is shot through with sin. I use, manipulate, exploit, control, possess, measure, and demand. Oh, Lord, bring all that to death. Every way I've learned to love, Crucify it, Lord. I don't want my old way. Oh, raise up in me your way of loving. Set me free from all those I love. Set them free for me. And love through me in your way. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And we're going to go right on praying. Uh, and I'll just pray it for you. Lord Jesus, I pray now that you cleave with the sword of truth between us and our heritage. Repeat this after me. Lord, I thank you for my heritage, but I cut free from it. I put it on the altar. Let me be dead to it. Let me be alive to you. You can reach into my heritage and use any part of it. But it can't reach into me and use me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to pray some more. Now, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my parents and for all that they were. Well, let's repeat that. Lord, I thank you for my parents, for all that they were, good and bad. I forgive them. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, I am born anew. I am not first son or daughter to them. I am son or daughter to you. I cut free. I cut every carnal tie. I loose myself from them. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, this doesn't mean you won't ever do anything for your parents again. It means that you will do for them when the Holy Spirit prompts you, but you will not have to do it compulsively. See the difference? I, I did more for my parents after I went through this than before. Because now I wanted to. 
but I wasn't controlled anymore. See? Okay, now, before we run out of time, let's go back to the subject we were supposed to be on, which is parental inversion substitute mate. How many of you, as we went through the list of symptoms, recognize you've got some parental inversion, some substitute mate stuff? See, that's most of us here. I thought that's why the Lord brought you anyway. Okay, how many of you recognize a number of the symptoms? Yeah. Now, how are we going to get free? First thing, you have to forgive both parents. Maybe one parent flaked out more than the other and you protected the other one, but you've got you to forgive both parents. Next thing, you got to pray to be forgiven for your, all of your resentments. Next thing, you pray bringing your parental inversion patterns to death on the cross. And then you need to up and resign the general managership of the universe. <laughs> and find to your chagrin that God can do very well without you. <laughs> okay? Ready to pray that? Okay. I'll pray a little while and ask you to repeat after me. It won't hurt to hold hands or put arms around her or whatever. Oh, Lord, I thank you for these keys of knowledge you're giving us to set us free. I'm so grateful you've been setting me free from that whole thing I grew up in and from all the patterns of it, Lord. And give you permission to smash the rest of them. <laughs> now, Lord Jesus... I pray that you come to each one of us, walk into the depths of the heart where it counts, so that what we're doing is not just a grown mental thing, but we ask you, Lord, to come into the depths of each heart here. And from the depths of our heart, we say aloud together, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for my parents, but I forgive them. I forgive my father for every way he failed. I forgive my mother for every way she failed. I forgive them for not having it together. I forgive them for not building for me an ambience of security so I could be a child. Lord, let your forgiveness now be upon me. Lord, bring to death in me all my practiced habits, all the ways I control, all the ways I shut down my emotions, all the ways I flee from intimacy, all the ways I find help in places where I shouldn't, bring all these things to death, Lord. And I resign the general managership of the universe. Oh, thank you, Lord. Teach me how to play. Amen. Now in that last, I wanted to teach a little after that. One of the worst symptoms that happens to parentally inverted people is their childhood is robbed and they are not free to play. They're not free to relax and enjoy life. They even feel guilty if they begin to enjoy life like they're not doing enough to keep chaos out of the world. <laughs> and if they play, they work at playing. <laughs> People have said of me, John can't sit still, can he? If I'm sitting still, I've got some card game of solitaire going in front of me. My sister, also afflicted, she can't do any. She's got to have some knitting, some tatting, some crocheting. She's got to have something going. And we feel guilty if we begin to enjoy life. 
We're not doing enough to keep chaos out. God's world is falling apart. Poor dear, we've got to help him. <laughs> so, that's been one of the hardest lessons for me is just to learn how to play. I mean, I play, but boy, do I play. <laughs> I mean, we'll get this thing done. What's what we're going to do it right. <laughs> and you aren't doing it right, and I'll shape up. You got to play right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have to learn how to have fun. I'll give you a list of the books. In 1973, we were sent to write and given seven books to write, titles at the time. We've written five, and then six others. And the first book is The Elijah Task. That is a call to the Lord's prophets to arise and learn their tasks and do them. It's not about inner healing. Second book, Restoring the Christian Family, that book is to prevent inner healing. <laughs> it's to teach families how to, be how, how to be families so they don't need to be healed. <laughs> then the main book, the one that sold a million five hundred thousand copies and more, Transformation of the Inner Man. Its sequel, Healing the Wounded Spirit, deals with the deeper things of woundings in our spirit that are normally not thought of by psychologists and so on, like captive spirit, like slumbering spirit. And the next book is The Renewal of the Mind. The worst enemy we have is not the devil. The worst enemy we have is our own mind. And we have to learn how to get that mind off the throne and let the renewed mind of Christ rule in us. Then we have also written, Paula has written a book, Healing Victims of Sexual Abuse, which was written when our son-in-law sexually violated his daughter, our granddaughter, and out of the hell of all that came from that, she wrote that book. Another book she wrote, Healing Women's Emotions. And then the, our publisher wrote to me and asked me to write a book, Why Some Christians Commit Adultery. I wrote it in that title. Jamie Buckingham reviewed it and said, No pastor should be let out of seminary with us being, this being required reading and the thing doesn't sell. And the reason it doesn't sell, it's in great big red thing with white adultery all over it, and the people are afraid to take it to the counter for fear they'll think they need it. So we're going to put it out in a brown paper bag. <laughs> and then Chosen wrote to me and to our son Mark and said, Inner healing grew up over here antagonistic to deliverance. Deliverance grew up here antagonistic to inner healing. We, you know, we, we know you do both. So would you write a book to reconcile the two? So we planned a seven-chapter book, seven chapter book to reconcile the two. But Jane Campbell, the editor, wrote to me and said, would you include a chapter inclu uh, which says delivering places and objects? And that grew into another chapter, also delivering animals. And that catapulted us beyond our original design, so we wrote the book, A Comprehensive Guide to Deliverance and Inner Healing. So that book is available in the bookstore. And then uh, Paula's brother, Norman Lee Bowman, with us wrote two others. One is called Waking the Slumbering Spirit, and the other is called Forgiveness. So those are all the books that we have out. I just wanted to tell about how I was miraculously healed. I had no identity when I was in, uh, before 1980. And uh, I was being prayed for in tongues at my church at the time in Princeton, New Jersey. and just like that, God restored my youth, 
He gave me autonomy, spontaneity. Uh, I felt good about myself, and I knew that everything I was told about myself growing up as a child was a lie, and that he created me who I was, not who I had become, because I didn't know who I was anymore. And it was the most miraculous thing that had happened to me. And then I thought, well, wow, why did he do this? And I said, oh, something's really coming. And sure enough, my ex-husband now had me in with uh, his attorney and my attorney and tried to put me out on the doorstep with nothing and to take the children. And uh, there was a lot of money involved, but I didn't even know about the money because it was kept secret. But I knew I could do anything now because I had stability, I knew who I was, and I had identity. And I knew that God was my victor and he would get me through, and he did. He did. Praise the Lord, right? Good testimony. We have just a few more minutes. S certain amount of steps to... Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I grew up parent parentally inverted, and um, I had suffered, uh, well, I still do, uh, from anxiety disorder, but uh, with the, Lord, the Lord's help, I have overcome quite a bit. And um, my question to you is, now that I am in recovery, um, how do I stop the cycle so that my children don't because like with like I was stuck I was homebound for like three years I did not leave the house and this affected my children um, now that I am sort of you know quote quote normal um, you know it's <laughs> um, like they're starting to you know like it seems as though they've got a, a normal life but what I'm afraid of is that this might affect them down the road you know like suppressed memories and stuff There's several answers to put together there. One of them is that when you come to a conference like this and you learn all these things, you think, oh, my poor kids, I've messed them up. So then you want to run home and straighten out your kids. <laughs> Don't do that. God knew just how you'd lost your kids up when he, when he sent them, and he sent them anyway. And at the right time, he will turn everything you did to glory in their life. So don't make too much of a project of it. Next thing, just enjoy your kids now. That's the best thing you can do with them. Just enjoy. Be a friend. Be play games with them. Laugh with them. Take them to Walt Disney comedies. Get uh, Cosby's himself. Watch it. Laugh, belly laugh together. Enjoy the kids. Then you can pray privately that whatever was in your heritage not descend into theirs but enjoy them what what if they're 25 yeah here's a principle the more you get you on the cross the more your children's health and ways will change automatically without your saying or doing a thing in relation to them. And I'll show you this that I did with the others. 1 Corinthians seven fourteen, the unbelieving partner is consecrated through the believing partner, else were they were their children unclean, but as it is they're holy. Well forget about the believing unbelieving. Your children are consecrated through you. So picture the father as one pain. P A N E not P-A-I-N, and picture the mother <coughs> as another pain under him. Now you can see the light of God, <coughs> the light of God comes down through those two pains to the children. So the more mess there is on your pains, the less light comes to the children. 
And the cleaner you are in God, the more light comes to the children. So Paul and I found as we learned these things and and the more we came to death on the cross, we watched our children's behavior change. They just became without our doing another thing because we're corporate and the stream coming through us was affecting them. That's the best thing you can do for your children is get is die. <coughs> there. Wait a minute. Oops. These are two questions, neither one on parental inversion. But the first one is, how do you respond to people who um, ask you why you are uh, so open about saying, uh, for instance, what you did or what other people did to you, basically splatting out other sins against you? And I know I personally, when I do that about my sins or anyone else's, I am told that I either have not forgiven myself or if I had forgiven them, I wouldn't be talking about this. And um, my other question is, you mention a lot um, this or that happened in Bible times and thus showing we are ignorant about it. And what are your resources for knowing those things about Bible times? Good. First about sharing things you'll find that the more open you can be, the better. But understand this. We are sharing openly about what we did and people did to us as testimony and teaching. In Revelation 12, where they overcame them with the word of God, by the blood of Jesus, and by their testimony. Um, and when you teach... The more you can reveal of your own sinfulness, the better. Minister out of your weakness and your brokenness. But when you're not teaching, uh, you have to be a little careful about where you're sharing about all this because it can become rehearsal and it can become um, demeaning and it can become hurtful. So you need to share in your small group, but you don't blot out everything you are everywhere anytime just in teaching and in the small group or in testimony to somebody to help them see now concerning where do we get this information I do have it with me a sheet of paper maybe I can get them to copy it off or put it up on the board for you what has happened is that <coughs> some scholars in the Western world have finally become aware that the Bible is an oriental book and that many of the cultural things behind the Bible are not known in the Western world, so we miss the richness of its meanings. So a number of scholars have gone into the Mideast, back into the villages where they've not yet become westernized, where the culture still pertains, and they have taught. So I'll give you some of you. want to take the notes down. The very best one that I know of is by Ken Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y, in a little book called The Cross and the Prodigal. Ken Bailey, The Cross and the Prodigal. The next book is by Fred White, W-I-G-H-T, Fred White. And the title is Manners and Customs of Bible Lands. And this is just a gold mine of revealing the culture. The third one. Bishop K.C. Pillai, P-I-L-L-A-I, -I, full name, Carnum, uh, let's see, I can't even remember his whole name. Uh, yeah, Carnum Chengoboroya Pillai, K.C. Pillai. But um, all you have to remember is P-I-L-L-A-I, -I, and the book is Light Through an Eastern Window. This one is nearly extinct. And he has others called uh, Orientalis Orientalisms from the Bible, Volume 1, Orientalisms from the Bible, Volume 2. They're very difficult to find. And then you have to sift through these because the culture varied at different times. And you have to check it all with the Bible and find out, well, now which one was appropriate to the Bible time? So, but there's extremely valuable stuff. I'll just give you one example. Do you remember when 
in Luke, Luke 15, and uh, the prodigal, the father of the prodigal, sees the son coming afar off, and he runs to meet him. Well, they traveled only in the early evening and the, in the evening and the early morning, and so that meant that the father went up there every day looking for his son, and he saw him and recognized him. Now, in the biblical country, no man ever runs. To run is disgraceful. It means you don't have faith. And to run, you must pull up your skirts, which exposes your ankles. And there are boys in the village who will taunt. And if the son had been allowed to come in the gate, the money that he took didn't belong just to their family. It belonged to the whole village. And he had squandered the wealth of the whole village. And the boys would know that, and they would know he'd been with harlots for the loose living. So they would taunt the son, and they'd throw stones at him. So the father ran to get there before the son could get into the village so that the father could take the taunting and the stoning by the boys on himself to prevent the son from having to take it. And that's the way Father God in Jesus runs to take our shame so we don't have to take it. Isn't that beautiful? That's just one example. I mean, I could spend a whole hour just lifting out to you cultural things from the prodigal son. But that's what they are. Now, uh, there are those here Who's here as team members, prayer team members? Okay, there's a few of the prayer team members here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, if you have recognized things in you, and uh, we've only prayed a general prayer about them, it would be good before you go off. You, uh, we have until five, I think. So it would be good before you go to come to the prayer team members. So prayer team members, why don't you just come up in front so they all see you. And uh, you can come to them for prayer. And while they're coming, let me say to you, please don't come to me. <laughs> I am exhausted and I have to teach tonight and I... I'm dressed this way because I had to appear on television with Paula this morning, so I've had quite a day already, and I have to teach tonight. 